So this is where we left off. Um, I had mentioned that uh, there were several types of uh, viral genomes out there. And I believe I showed you this slide already, but it's kind of a good recap to uh, kind of remember that these are the processes cells have to do, right? They have to do transcription and translation. Viruses, they have so many different types of genomes, they don't necessarily do these, all of these things. So uh, as a consequence, uh, there are actually several uh, types of viral genomes, seven that have been classified under something called the uh, Baltimore system. So some viruses are double-stranded DNA viruses. So that's what the DS stands for, double-stranded. And uh, these are replicated in a cell very similar to the way um, we replicate our DNA, and then it makes RNA, and then we translate that into proteins. Uh, these types of viruses are usually done in the nucleus because, of course, that's where we have all our DNA enzymes. Uh, some viruses are single-stranded DNA, and that actually gets converted to double-stranded DNA first before it gets converted into messenger RNA. Uh, there are double-stranded RNA viruses. They skip the DNA step entirely. There are uh, RNA-stranded viruses, uh, and there's two strands. Uh, one kind of looks like the scent strand, and one kind of looks like the anti-scent strand, so we use plus and negative when we talk about viruses. I don't want to confuse you too much, but just know that there's single-stranded RNA viruses, and they all have to get converted to messenger RNA before proteins can get made. There's the other type, the um, uh, negative single-stranded RNA viruses, and there are also uh, retroviruses. Uh, this is like HIV. So if you take a look here, this is interesting because we have to, uh, we start off with RNA and then we go to DNA and then we go back to RNA. So kind of a weird system there that uh, HIV has going on there. That's why it's called retro because it's backwards. And there are other double-stranded DNA viruses that for some reason convert to single-stranded RNA first. I'm not really sure why they do that, but it works for them. So what was the key point here? This was the point I emphasized last time, is that viruses, uh, their whole goal is to deliver the genetic material to the host, and the host is going to use uh, its enzymes to read that genetic material and make viral parts. So that's gonna be new viral um, genomes and new viral proteins, and that's how viruses get made. So these are some examples of some different viruses, and maybe you've heard of a few of these. And uh, just showing you these examples, you don't need to know them for the class. And just showing you that there's a, a whole a variety of different ones. So we talked about these herpes viruses already. These are enveloped. You can see there are double-stranded DNA viruses that are not enveloped. And some of these cause, uh, um, some of these adenoviruses cause uh, basically cold-like symptoms. And there's a few others out there. I'm not familiar with the tumor-causing viruses but uh, that are adenoviruses, but there are others. Uh, Single-stranded DNA parvovirus double strand RNA reovirus that causes a type of diarrhea in children. And uh, these plus stranded RNA viruses are a huge, huge group. And you can see on here, I have this one here. So the uh, SARS coronavirus, um, of which there's a few now known, uh, and we're gonna talk about that in more detail. Uh, other single strand RNA viruses include rabies viruses, and uh, retroviruses like HIV. So I found this poster. If you're interested in viral classification, I know it's a bit confusing, but uh, you know this is an opportunity maybe for you if you want to change something you can get on the committee. Um, but I like this because it shows you that there's lots of strategies to classify things. We can classify things based on uh, you know whether it's an animal virus or a plant virus or a vertebrate or invertebrate virus. You can see some of them are, they talk about classification based on genome. They also sometimes talk about classification based on structure. Is it enveloped? Is it icosahedral? And those kind of things. So all of those words are thrown around when we talk about virus classification, which does not make things any better, but uh, you kind of get used to it when you start thinking about viruses for a while. So quick test yourself question, and then we'll talk about COVID-19. Uh, going back to last day, we were talking about the different uh, components to a virus. And uh, maybe I'll draw you a little picture here in the corner. Uh, and if you remember, I drew a picture of a virus and it had a little genome like that. And I said the genome is going to be RNA or DNA. It can be double-stranded or single-stranded of either. And then it's got this coat. There's my protein coat. 
looks something like that. We'll make sure that RNA is labeled better. So there's my protein coat, and the protein coat is called a capsid. And then sometimes the dotted line, they have something around them called an envelope, and that envelope is going to be a membrane that was taken when they escaped from a host cell, and it's going to contain glycoproteins. So hopefully that helps us a little bit here. You can see this is just a matching question. So uh, it says here, what is protein? Okay, well, this uh, glycoprotein, maybe that helps. Um, enzymes, so protein actually could go with both of those. I didn't mean to have a double answer. I was just looking at enzymes. But this glyco, of course, goes with carbohydrate. So hopefully you know glyco means carbohydrate by now. The genome is made out of nucleic acids. And of course, the envelope is made out of phospholipids. So it says, which components are part of all viruses? All viruses have a genome, so they have nucleic acids. And uh, all viruses have a capsid, which is not, not actually on this. Everything else, some viruses have glycoproteins, some of them don't. Some viruses have those lipids, some of them don't. So if, uh, if that's confusing, go back and take a look at the basics. Uh, you're going to need to know a little bit about virus structure and uh, some of these things we've been talking about for the final exam. So uh, in your notes, uh, you may notice there's a bit of information on HIV. We're not going to cover that this semester. A little bit of information on influenza. They're very interesting viruses uh, biologically. They do some unique things. Uh, we also, uh, in the notes, talk about viroids, prions, and transposons. I am also going to skip that part because what I'm going to do is spend that time. And we're going to talk about SARS coronavirus 2, and we're going to talk a little bit about vaccines. So that's what we're going to do for about the next 20 minutes. And then we'll talk about the final exam. So when you're studying, you can just skip over the HIV and the influenza and the viroids and prions and transposons. If you have any questions about them, you can certainly ask them. But they won't be on the final exam. All right, so let's talk about this new pandemic. Um, yeah, okay, so this is interesting. Uh, a pandemic. Uh, Maybe some of you don't remember so well, uh, but uh, you know, the last pandemic we had was about 10, 11 years ago. That was the H1N1 flu. Uh, that was a little easier to control because we actually have a successful flu vaccine and uh, we we're able to produce that um, relatively easily using existing technologies. Uh, so this time around, we have uh, a novel virus, meaning it was new to humans. And uh, I'll talk about a little bit about where it came from. Uh, this was the last time I checked, November 16th, so that was about a week ago. Actually, that was almost two weeks ago uh, in terms of where we're at with cases. And uh, you probably know that the number of cases, at least in Alberta and BC, Quebec, Manitoba, actually most of Canada, have, have uh, increased over the last two weeks quite significantly. Although Canada is looking pretty good compared to some of these other countries that are out there. So uh, I found this little daily cases map. So you can see that there's the initial uh, burst of uh, infections. And you can see this fall, it's been on a pretty steady uh, increase. And we're at the highest number of infections we've ever had daily in Canada right now. And Alberta's not looking so good. Although Fort McMurray is not too bad. Uh, Edmonton is really the hot spot in Alberta. So uh, where did this thing come from, okay? Uh, let's talk a little bit about coronaviruses. We've known about coronaviruses since the 1960s, by the way. And there are four coronaviruses that are known to be, uh, I guess you'd call them common cold coronaviruses, right? So you know about head colds. And you get a runny nose, sometimes a, you know, sometimes a bit of a sore throat. And uh, they're really, really annoying. And that's about it. So you can see it says that they're low pathogenicity, which means they don't usually kill people very, very rarely. You know, they might lead to a secondary infection. Maybe they, you know, get, help someone to get pneumonia or something like that. But these viruses don't, uh, don't kill people. In fact, a lot of these infections we get uh, relatively common. Um, it seems that people get infected with these uh, probably in some cases annually. And in many cases, you don't even show disease. Um, so, uh, you know, all these viruses crossed over to humans, uh, we're not exactly sure when. You can see some estimates there on the slides, and they originated in bats and rats. And uh, usually they um, uh, might go through an intermediate host um, as, they, as they adapt, because uh, humans aren't usually in contact with bats, for example. 
Whereas the bats, uh, you know, so they, they, the intermediate host sometimes is important. So 1960s, um, yeah, I mean, since then, we haven't really studied these a ton because they don't make us that sick. Uh, so the interest hasn't been too high. Uh, since then, though, we've had some other coronavirus um, incidences uh, back in 2002. So some of you were probably alive, but probably don't remember it because you're probably quite young at the time. Um, I remember it. I was in Ontario because uh, this was the first SARS, so we're calling it SARS-1 now or SARS Classic, and uh, uh, people were getting really sick. Uh, I think there were about 400 cases in Toronto and about 40 deaths. So, I mean, really it was about a 10% of people were dying from it. They were uh, suffering from having uh, issues with breathing. And uh, thankfully, this was really easy to lock down because people had uh, severe symptoms and those people were traced and isolated. And it actually was only Toronto that had it in Canada. A few other places worldwide, it, it got in Toronto uh, from one flight from Hong Kong. It, it was originated in China and, um, and, uh, and uh, it, it went away that summer. That was kind of the end of summer of 2003. Um, that was kind of the end of it. Uh, so, you know, skip forward another decade and another coronavirus. We had MERS. So MERS stands for Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And you can see there that it's found in camels. So Saudi Arabia, um, I think South Korea and a couple other places. And there's been a few outbreaks of that. And it's also pretty nasty, very dangerous to get. Um, so these are highly pathogenic, meaning a lot of people, a uh, very high percentage of people die from these. And then who knows when, maybe last year, uh, we're calling it COVID-19 because we think that's what happened, 2019. Um, we have a new virus. And uh, this one here uh, is in the process of becoming a human virus. And in fact, it's probably here to stay. You don't just infect, you know, a billion people on the planet or whatever we're at now. And uh, I don't think it's going to disappear unless we can uh, get a really effective vaccine or something like that and get a high percentage of humans vaccinated for it. And uh, you can see uh, um, we, we, we don't know the intermediate host. Uh, it definitely came from a bat. Uh, there have been a lot of, uh, a lot of coronaviruses uh, uh, recognized in bats, and they're like 96, 97% identical. So we're pretty sure it came from a bat, possibly through an intermediate species called a pangolin. So a pangolin is worth looking up. Some people are probably wondering what a pangolin is. This is a pangolin. Um, it is very cute. It's a mammal. It has scales. It's found in Africa and it's found in Asia in different parts. I think there's about six or eight species of these things. They're highly endangered because uh, they're trafficked. So people will kill these things for the meat. And there's a lot of traditional medicine practices that use these scales, unfortunately. And so these things are, are, um, are a desired item. The scales are just basically uh, made of keratin like your fingernails. So I don't know why they're being used in medicine, uh, traditional medicine practices, but it's unfortunate for this organism because it's, it's highly endangered. endangered. Uh, here's another picture. I, I just could not stop looking these up. They're super cute. Uh, the, uh, the young rides on the tail. Uh, you can see they've got this tongue. They're sort of like anteaters, and uh, they eat insects like crazy. I'll show you one more picture. Apparently, when they feel threatened, they roll up into a little ball, which is just absolutely adorable. So some people are, are proposing that the pangolin is an intermediate host because we found, um, we found a virus that was uh, a little bit more similar than the bat, bat virus uh, in a pangolin. Uh, but it's also possible that the virus went somehow to humans or some other species and then humans infected the pangolin, right? Uh, or, or some other species did. So we don't really know, but uh, it's possible. And pangolins are just worth it to look up because they're, they're cute. So here's kind of just a very, very brief timeline here. Um, of what, uh, what we're looking at with this pandemic. So 2019, uh, a patient was described in China. And uh, by the end of the year, um, the government of China confirmed that they had, uh, they were having some pneumonia of unknown cause. And it wasn't until January where it was actually identified as a brand new novel virus, a coronavirus. So, uh, you know, it's hard to believe the virus was only identified in January and uh, it's, it hasn't really that been long. Um, probably when most of the world was taking notice was in March, because in March, that's when Italy was having um, a serious crisis with millions of people getting sick and locking down all sorts of regions of the country. 
uh, lots of elderly people were dying in Italy and it, it really terrified us. Um, a few days later, after they started closing their schools, um, the World Health Organization declared a pandemic and um, the very same day, the NBA canceled this season, which I thought was interesting, happened at the exact same time. I guess they, they knew things were coming. And uh, kind of the rest is history, right? Uh, everything else sort of follows suit. You know, you're looking at other organizations closing down, borders closing down, all those kind of things. And uh, probably everyone has their own story about what they were doing in March. So um, COVID-19 uh, stands for Coronavirus Disease 2019. And uh, uh, different people named the virus. I think it was the uh, International Committee and they called it uh, SARS-CoV-2, which stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus 2. So if you hear me say SARS-CoV-2, I'm talking about the virus. And uh, so it is an enveloped single strand RNA virus. You can see it has, uh, there's the envelope right there, and it has these spike proteins. And uh, these spike proteins are important when we want to talk about the vaccine because that is what our immune system is probably going to interact with. So it's probably the best um, vaccine candidate. So you can see uh, coronavirus, by the way, means crown. And so uh, whoever uh, discovered this, it was actually, I don't think she's a Canadian or not, it was a woman. And uh, she kind of looked at this and she's like, yeah, it kind of looks like little jewels on a crown, so I'll call it a coronavirus. So kind of cool. So uh, this is a, a, an RNA virus genome, and you can see it has a handful of genes. I'm not exactly sure how many genes are on this thing. I think it's uh, 20 or 30 or something like that, or maybe it's less. I'd have to look it up. And here's the spike protein right there that we're trying to make a, a vaccine against. So I'll just show you briefly the uh, life cycle of this virus since we've talked about viral life cycles. Uh, you can see the very first thing that is going on here is that this spike protein, this little green spike protein here is recognizing a receptor here called the ACE2 receptor. Now the ACE2 receptor is in your respiratory tract. And uh, that's why this is a respiratory disease because that's where the virus is going to infect. It brings it in by uh, endocytosis and uh, the viral genome is going to be released into the cytoplasm. So uh, once the viral genome is released, uh, you can see we have two things that are happening here. Uh, we have uh, replication of the viral genome and transcription of the viral genome. And of course, uh, the transcribed RNA is going to find its way to a ribosome, and the ribosome is going to make more viral proteins. So some of these viral proteins are going to get made over here in the ER, in the endoplasmic reticulum, because they're going to become uh, new spike glycoproteins. And then eventually it's going to assemble, and you're going to have the virus budding off and uh, maybe infecting more cells uh, after that process. So relatively straightforward for a, a virus replication cycle. Um, like I said, using all the processes that we've talked about, transcription and translation, and uh, that's how we're making new virus particles. So let's talk a little bit about the disease. You're probably relatively familiar with the symptoms. We have been talking about them all the time. We're screening ourselves everywhere we go. We're asked to, uh, you know, what symptoms do we have? There's actually a pretty big long list. These are some of the main ones. Uh, fever, cough, shortness of breath, so respiratory uh, symptoms, uh, cough and shortness of breath. Uh, fever is not caused by the virus. That's actually caused by our immune system, our immune system recognizing that there's an infection and causing, uh, causing that symptoms. Some people, uh, about a third of people, actually uh, have a loss of sense of uh, their sense of taste and, and smell as well, which is kind of interesting. So I just wanted to quickly kind of compare with some other respiratory viruses here, okay? Because uh, I think it's important to know a little bit about what is going on here. So first thing to mention is, right, there's these other respiratory diseases we talk about, like the flu, which full name is influenza, and the cold. And these are all caused by different viruses, right? So COVID-19, of course, this new coronavirus. Uh, influenza is caused by influenza viruses, and you can see uh, the genome is different. It's, an, it's a, a, a negative single-stranded RNA virus. And then there's the cold, and the cold is caused by about 200 different viruses, rhinoviruses, uh, those coronaviruses I mentioned, some adenoviruses. So that's the first thing to note. They are different viruses. Second thing is, do we have a vaccine? We do have a flu shot. It's an annual flu shot uh, because the virus mutates every year. For colds, we don't. 
Uh, SARS-CoV-2, well, I'll talk about vaccines in a minute, but there's uh, probably about 200 or 300 in development right now. And hopefully we'll have something very soon. Uh, what else can we say? It's worth it to think a little bit about the symptoms, right? So you can see uh, COVID-19, like I said, fever and cough are pretty common. Uh, not always. Uh, sometimes people have more milder symptoms like a headache, uh, like I said, loss of sense of smell and those kind of things. Influenza, a fever is very common. Fatigue is very common and aches and pains are very common. So kind of some overlapping symptoms, but that uh, shortness of breath is not common with influenza. So, uh, you know, this is why we have to do testing to make sure that, uh, you know, you have uh, the disease we think you have. The cold is more, it's not uh, deep into your respiratory system. It's more your nose and sinuses. So you're ending up with symptoms around that, right? So runny nose and maybe a sore throat or stuffy sinuses and itchy eyes. I guess I already had them circled in my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay, so, um, like I said, I could go on about uh, about this for a while, but I kind of just want to talk about vaccines for a few minutes. And because uh, um, I think it's important, there's a lot of conversation about this now, and it's important that people are informed. And uh, you guys are science students, so it's important that, uh, you know, you do communicate some of the science you learn to people that don't know it. Um, so what is a vaccine? A vaccine is a preparation that is hopefully going to uh, give you an immune response uh, when you see the real thing. So you can see here, they're showing a whole bunch of different things going on. We've got, uh, you know, you've got a virus, it's infecting you, and, uh, and you've got these uh, immune cells, and those immune cells uh, recognize it, and they, they have an immune response, and then they have memory. So some of those immune cells kind of, they sit around for a while, waiting for another infection. So if you've had uh, um, a number of other diseases like chickenpox, or if you've had another vaccine, we have these memory cells sitting in, around inside of us. And the next time you have the uh, illness, uh, in most cases, you don't even know you've, you've had the virus because uh, the immune response is so fast uh, and, uh, and it's, it can be very, very protective. So what about a COVID-19 vaccine? So it turns out we are throwing a whole bunch of different strategies at this. Some of these strategies are new. They've never been done in humans before. And you can see there's a whole bunch listed here. I found this nice infographic. If you want to read this article, I highly recommend it. Uh, it's a little old. I think it was written in May. Um, but it's right on the spot. Very educational. Very good. Um, so some traditional approaches to making vaccines is we uh, can either take an attenuated virus. So what does that mean? It means it's been weakened, right? And and there's a lot of different ways you can weaken these viruses. You can, um, nowadays we can, we can alter their genetic code. You know, maybe you take out a gene that's causing disease or, or you can uh, find ways to uh, alter the gene so it grows really slowly. And so um, attenuated viruses can still infect. They grow so slow, they don't cause disease, but they do grow and they do uh, cause an immune response. And this is kind of the oldest way to make a vaccine. Uh, sometimes we inactivate uh, viruses. You can see this one here on the right is inactivated. That's what we do with the flu shot. Uh, we have the live virus and we kill it with, uh, with chemicals and uh, it still does uh, give an immune response. So kind of two strategies, just using the virus, growing it up and either weakening it or killing it. And both of these things, like I said, are going to prime that immune response so that when you do hit the live um, pathogenic virus, uh, you're hopefully going to get an immune response. And I say hopefully because we don't know a lot about the immunology of this new virus. We're still learning that. You know, some, um, some immune memory, uh, you know, will last 50 years. Some will last 10 years. Some will last one or two years. Uh, so we're hoping these vaccines will be the long memory type. Um, but we don't know. Maybe we'll have to have an annual um, COVID shot, like the annual flu shot. I'm not really sure. Um, some vaccines are basically uh, subunit vaccines, so you don't use the whole virus. Um, let's just, let's for example, uh, use the spike protein. So I could use a little bit of PCR. I could do this uh, very easily. Um, the sequences are all over the internet. Uh, I could use PCR to make uh, some DNA to code for the spike protein. I could put that DNA into an E. coli plasmid and I could grow spike protein. A relatively easy process. Uh, it can be done in a few weeks. Um, purify that spike protein, inject it into humans, and we have an immune response against that protein. 
So this is another technique that can be used. And this is, this is uh, used by, uh, for example, the diphtheria and tetanus um, shot. Uh, these, uh, these are all um, basically uh, subunit uh, type vaccines. So there's uh, a couple of new methods and they're getting a lot of press and uh, they're kind of cool. Uh, one is these nucleic acid vaccines. I'm just gonna ignore these DNA vaccines because my understanding is they don't work very well. But the, uh, the RNA vaccines, um, these have been getting a ton of press because uh, they were, uh, there were two companies working on them and they, I don't even know what they were testing, um, but uh, they had everything all ready to go. And then this pandemic came out and they said, hey, it would be very easy for us to use the same technology to do this for the new virus. In fact, it took Moderna two days to make this vaccine. So how, how is this vaccine done? Well, they, we have the genome. We have the RNA sequence of the spike protein, right? So what they do is, is uh, I'm not, they won't say how they make the RNA um, because that's probably some sort of trade secret, but there's a, probably a lot of ways we could guess how they could do it. They could do it synthetically or they could make it in yeast or something like that. So basically you make the RNA and you code for whatever that is in that new disease, in this case, the spike protein. And the RNA gets uh, um, uh, mixed with some sort of lipid. We don't know what kind of lipid it is. You can see this lipid coat here. And uh, probably some sort of phospholipid, uh, but again, they don't say because it's a trade secret. And that basically helps it get into the cell. And then so what happens is they inject the RNA uh, into, into the human tissue, so just in the shoulder. And uh, you can see here's the RNA here. And what happens with RNA? Well, it gets in the cell and in the cell it finds a ribosome and in the ribosome is gonna make virus proteins. And then those virus proteins are going to uh, stimulate an immune response. So this is super cool. Like I said, they were able to make this vaccine in two days and start human trials, like, like literally as soon as they could get approval. And, uh, and maybe this will be the, uh, uh, the technology of the future with new viruses and new diseases because it's apparently super easy to manufacture. That's what they say anyway. The storage is the other issue. It has to be frozen and, and not every clinic has a freezer. There's another new type of vaccine getting a little bit of a press as well because um, there's been some, some success in the UK with this. Again, a brand new technology. I think they had actually just made an Ebola vaccine on this and had it approved. And so it was relatively easy to adapt this technology. And this is something called uh, using a virus-like particle. So how does that work? Well, you, you, can, take a, you can take a virus, um, maybe a weakened one. You can see that the one strategy is using a weakened measles virus. Or you take a virus that doesn't grow in humans. So in the case of the one that's in the UK, they're using a chimpanzee adenovirus. So why that? Well, it doesn't grow in humans, it grows in chimpanzees, right? But it looks like a virus, and all they do is they change the DNA on this thing so that the spike proteins are the, are the virus of interest. So in this case, it would be the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And uh, why, why go through all this bother? Because the immune system recognizes things that are big a lot easier. If you just inject the spike proteins, um, sometimes the immune response isn't so strong when you're looking at little tiny proteins. But if you have something big that looks like a whole virus, that gets the immune system's attention and, uh, and, and can lead to a much stronger response. There's probably other reasons too, but that's my understanding of this. So what are we doing for the COVID-19 vaccine? Pretty much all those things and probably a whole bunch of other things. Um, this is an old graph um, and uh, I'll show you some numbers here in a moment, but uh, all these strategies are being used and uh, um, in different parts of the world. Uh, this is a vaccine tracker that is, uh, there's a few of them on the internet. Um, I actually did look and I forgot to update this because these numbers have all gone up. I told you there were um, at least 200 vaccine candidates. Um, the vaccine tracker calls them vaccines, but they're not vaccines yet because we're not using them yet. Okay, so they're all vaccine candidates. Um, there are other ones. Uh, these are just the ones that are actually to the point where they're, they're doing human testing, right? There are about 200 more. And you can see uh, we've got different phases. So phase one is they really just take about a dozen people and look for safety and side effects and all that. And phase two, that's where they roll it out to a few hundred people and uh, they're still looking for safety. They're always looking for safety at every stage. And uh, here's where they're looking for an immune response. So they're gonna test the person's blood and look for antibodies. And uh, phase three, this is the very important, very expensive phase. This is where they do about 30 to 40,000 people. 
And uh, this is where they're actually looking for protection against disease. So um, if, if you only do a few hundred people, not everyone may get exposed to the disease. So you have to do a huge number um, and, and hope that some people are gonna get exposed to the disease. And so we're very close uh, to having some vaccines, uh, super close. Uh, I'll talk about three of them here in a moment. Um, so Canada, what are they doing? Uh, Canada has invested a lot of money so far uh, in a lot of companies. Uh, these five, they've invested the most and um, the whole idea is that some of these companies uh, may not make it. The, the vaccine may not prove to be safe or it may not work very well. And so the idea is to put your eggs in many baskets and hopefully a couple will work and we'll have lots of doses for Canadians. And uh, so th those are some of the ones that, that Canada is looking at. You can see different strategies, right? RNA, protein subunits, RNA, viral vectors. So lots of interesting things going on here. So uh, very, very recently, so November 9th, Pfizer was the first company to announce that they are basically done or concluding their phase three trial, and they are saying it is 90% effective. So what does that mean? It means they did 15,000 um, people uh, for the vaccine, and they had 15,000 people with a placebo. So a placebo is just a, a fake shot. There's nothing in it. There's just saline or something in it. And so when they looked at the two groups, about 100 people got sick in the, uh, in the placebo group and only 10 people got sick in the control group. So that showed that it was about 90% effective. Um, they're still analyzing the data. They're, they're starting to release a little bit more information. They, you know, they haven't published it yet. They've just published press releases. You know, you can look at the different demographics, uh, you know, men versus women, older people versus younger people and those kind of things. But uh, any disease in the vaccinated people was also less severe, which is, which is very, very good to hear. A um, few days later, literally one week later, uh, another RNA company announced that theirs was even better, 94.5% effective. This is incredible. I don't think people realize how incredible this is. It normally takes eight years to develop a vaccine, and they're never 90-something percent effective. Very few vaccines are, are that effective. Um, um, so this is really incredible, this RNA technology. Uh, like I said, one of the issues is the cold chain. Uh, some of these have to be stored at like minus 70 degrees, which is kind of like, you know, everyone has a freezer like that. Uh, but they'll probably work out the kinks as they go along. And uh, there's one other that uh, has hit the news too, probably because they felt pressure to uh, uh, release their news release. Uh, this is the AstraZeneca vaccine. This is in the UK. This is the one with the chimpanzee adenovirus. And you can see right here, chimpanzee adenovirus. And uh, there's the vector they're calling it Chadox. Initially, I think they renamed it for some, uh, something else. And um, they're also finding that it's, it's, that it's highly effective as well. They've released some of their data as well, although it's still ongoing. Um, so lots of options. I think the biggest question is, you know, at this point, what's the next step? Uh, the next step is they're all applying for emergency use. So emergency use means that it can start getting used in high risk healthcare workers and maybe military and a few things like that. And then the step after that would be it to apply for, for full use. And, and uh, so, it, you know, these could be approved as early as January. Now, what does that mean for us? It means we're not going to get a vaccine in January. It's probably going to take at least another six months or more for them to actually produce millions and millions of doses. And uh, unless you're a healthcare worker or high risk, uh, you're probably not going to be the first in line to be able to get the vaccine. But uh, I think there's a lot of optimism that by next September we'll actually be in classes and, uh, and not on Zoom every, every day, all day long. So that is very exciting. So if you have any questions about that, let me know. I, I know tons about viruses and these kind of things. Um, you know, this is kind of my last thought on viruses, right? And we've, we've learned this the hard way with, with distancing and those kind of things. And, and uh, viruses spread very easily, particularly this one, and uh, has spread across the world very, very quickly. Okay, so I have a little bit of time left and uh, I want to talk about uh, the lab exam. So I got to pull up that uh, uh, PowerPoint slide in a moment here. Where is it? Okay, there it is. That's the one. Just bear with me for a second here. Okay, so let's talk about the lab exam. Uh, I basically just finished grading them. Um, right before class. I have not had a chance to add it up yet um, and input the grades. Uh, but a couple of general pieces of, of uh, uh, 
so some feedback and a couple of comments on this. Uh, I think the lab exam probably was a little longer and a little harder than, than um, I had expected. Uh, there were uh, a few people that didn't complete the exam and uh, there were a few questions on there that were left blank by certain people and it was a little all over the map. Um, not really any trends necessarily in terms of which questions were harder. It just seemed that uh, everybody struggled with, you know, at least one place on the exam. Um, I'm guessing the average was a little lower than usual. And uh, I'm, I'm not gonna be adjusting any marks at this point. Uh, I might come back and look at this when all the grades come in at the end of the semester. Um, so if you, um, if you did a score a low on the lab exam, uh, you can discuss with me. But uh, like I said, I'm not gonna be adjusting any grades at this point until all the grades come in and I kind of see how everything looks uh, in, in the big picture. But some general feedback on this thing, okay? Um, number one, and I know it's too late for this now, uh, but uh, I've been warning you, when I write comments on your reports, I'm not doing this because I like writing comments. I want you to read those comments and I want you to take that feedback. So for example, one of the questions on the lab exam was talking about damage and membranes at different temperatures. Okay, I know that was something I commented on many reports about that uh, because you didn't have it right. Uh, you know, what is going on at minus 20? Ice crystals form. Okay, if I ask you that and I don't see something about ice crystals in the final exam, I know you haven't read my comments, and, uh, and so maybe I was wasting my time. But comments are important. Uh, take the feedback and use it. Uh, I said several times the photosynthesis lab would be on the lab exam, and uh, it was. And some people seem to struggle with uh, not knowing how to do that question. Um, actually, there were two questions on it. Uh, so just a comment there. Um, collaboration, uh, maybe this comes as a surprise, but I did not have one lab exam. I had a few with different numbers and different data, and some people collaborated and used the wrong data and didn't get marks on those questions. So, um, sorry if that's you, but you were told, uh, you know, um, use the resources available to you, but you must do your own work. And so that was important. So what about drawings? This kind of was, uh, um, I'm not sure what's going on here. People can't use the binomial name in italics or underlined. Uh, people don't know that the titles go below. These are pretty basic things. A few people lost marks for those kind of things. Uh, using a ruler, uh, just some very basic things that I've been giving feedback on all semester. So uh, please try to take my feedback and, and listen. You're going to you know, hear the same things over and over again in other science courses. Uh, calculations, uh, last point is uh, show all your work and show your units because uh, can't give you part marks if you just have a number written down or you don't have all the information there. So it's really important that you do show all your work. Okay, so uh, let's talk about the final exam. And uh, I realize I've only got about 10 minutes left, but all of Wednesday will be review. Um, Make sure you come on Wednesday with uh, maybe a piece of paper. Uh, I'll probably do a few exercises and, and uh, um, give you time to sort of work through them with me um, so that, uh, you know, having a piece of paper might, might be helpful. Um, if you are, uh, you know, looking for some good study uh, breaks, Calvin Hobbes is always a good one as well. So I think I showed you this here last day. Uh, maybe I had, well, maybe I had slightly, okay. This is last year's slide, sorry, because we're not doing this is the wrong date. I, I uh, showed you a slide the other day. I apologize. Uh, if I have the wrong one up on the uh, on Moodle, I will I will change that. But uh, this is uh, yeah. So let me see if I can find that old slide because this is all the wrong data here. Got it here somewhere. What did I do with it? Hold on, just bear with me for a moment. Okay, I thought I had it right here somewhere. Uh, sorry, I cannot find it. Uh, thought it was here. I'll just check one more place. Okay, uh, looking at...
Okay, almost there, and uh, yes, there it is. So I found it. It's going to screen share. There it is. Okay. So slightly different, not really too much different in a lot of ways, other than we're not writing at the Sports and Wellness Center. Um, it's going to be on Moodle, like we have done before. Um, the balance of the exam is a little bit different. Um, it's going to be 80 marks, like I always have my final exams are 80 marks. A combination of some of the types of questions you've seen before, multiple choice, matching, um, there'll be some fill in the blank kind of short answer type questions. And uh, there'll be 10 marks for a transcription, translation, mutation um, questions. Um, I think there's going to be two of them. They're not going to be the same. One of them will be more focused on transcription, translation. The other might be on mutations. Um, I had no, I'd, I'd written down some ideas. And uh, there'll be uh, some long answer questions, um, probably based on transcription and translation and replication. Um, but I have a couple ideas for some other things as well. So um, hopefully there's no surprises at this point. I have been giving you lots of hints as we've gone along. So uh, hopefully that helps. You can see my other note here that 70% of the test, most of the test is going to be covering uh, all the topics since topic 13. So on DNA and all that other stuff. Um, so uh, focus on replication, transcription, translation, um, but don't forget all the other things as well. So just a quick primer, uh, what we did cover. So this is the first two thirds of the course. We covered uh, kind of the introduction around the cell and studying cells. Second part was more about uh, energy and, uh, and cell division. And then the last part of the course, we've covered uh, all sorts of DNA stuff, transcription, translation, replication. Uh, and then we talked a little bit about uh, uh, genetic regulation and a little bit about um, biotechnology and a little bit about viruses. So I have a whole bunch of slides here uh, in this review package and I uh, think what I want to do is just kind of go through them really, really quickly right now and then we're gonna come back on Wednesday and like I said, I'll have some problems to show for you uh, and, uh, and other things to work through. So topic 13, we talked about some different experiments. We talked about some historical, historical experiments uh, uh, that were looking at DNA being the genetic material. Talked about the structure of DNA, which is hugely important when we're talking about all of the other units after this. We keep coming back to the structure of DNA, five prime to three prime, and, uh, and all those kind of things. So here is a nucleotide, got all three components, a phosphate, a pentose sugar, and a nitrogenous base. Then we talked about Watson and Crick and some of the evidence that they had uh, looked at to um, determine the structure of DNA. So one of the things they discovered is that DNA was complementary and anti-parallel. So hopefully you know what these two things mean, okay? You know, this is kind of a classic uh, kind of exam question asking what they mean or having some sort of uh, multiple choice around it. You know, complementary for DNA strands means and then A, B, C, D, and E, okay? So make sure you do know what these things are and know what this five prime, the three prime thing is all about. Uh, we talked about DNA replication. There were uh, several enzymes we talked about. In fact, there were six enzymes and proteins that we talked about. So make sure that you know what these things are. And this will be something I will we'll review on Wednesday. Uh, and there's a picture kind of showing um, the process as well. So you've got uh, six in there, right? We've got DNA polymerase, a ligase, primase, that's three, single-stranded binding protein, that's four, helicase, and topoisomerase. So six different proteins and enzymes, plus there's an RNA primer here. That's another word to know. Okazaki fragment, that's another thing to know. Leading strand and lagging strand. So I know it's super complex, but I'm, I'm uh, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's something that it's important that you learn. Uh, so there's some of the other enzymes there. Like I said, I'm just zipping through this really quickly because I do want to finish up on time for you today. Um, topic, uh, was this 13, 15, 15 is in genetic code. So we talked about, uh, you know, kind of an introduction to these, uh, to these processes. And uh, like I said, we'll cover this when we look at a review. Uh, like I said, I'm just flipping through this quickly. 
Uh, eukaryotes, remember, things are compartmentalized. So uh, this will come back and, and there'll be uh, something on the exam about this, uh, understanding uh, which proteins are sent to the cytoplasm versus which proteins are sent to the endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, topic 16 is transcription. So remember, uh, we talked about the two different strands of the, uh, the DNA, the scent strand and the template strand. And so it's important that you know what those things are and, and what they're doing. I told you before, the other important thing to know is uh, you know, where the start codon is, okay? Start codon is on the scent strand. So this is upside down that I usually draw in my notes, but this is from the textbook, so I, that's what I have thrown in. Uh, three stages, uh, initiation, elongation, termination. So lots of words there to know. We've got the promoter, that's important. Hopefully you know what a promoter is by now. Um, lots of words, like I said, RNA polymerase. And what are these transcription factors? What are those and so on. We've also got some processing. So capping and tailing and splicing that goes on in eukaryotes. So maybe I will write that here, eukaryotes. There we go. Uh, topic 17 was translation. So translation happens at the uh, ribosome. And you can see all the players here. We've got our messenger RNA. So messenger RNA. We've got our small ribosomal subunit, our large ribosomal subunit. And this here is our transfer RNA, which is attached to an amino acid. So AA for amino acid. Um, there's a, ATP and GTP involved in this, uh, but we're not gonna kind of go into all that detail on this. Three sites, remember we have the A site, in the middle is the P site, I guess it's labeled right here, and then we have the E site. Three stages, initiation, elongation, uh, termination. We'll spend a little bit of time reviewing this on Wednesday as well. Okay, so one thing we're definitely going to do on Wednesday is one of these transcription translation questions. And uh, so I'm not going to do this now, but uh, just another reminder that I do have a practice question in the study guide found on Moodle. And uh, that's a good one to look at because uh, I'm going to be looking at that when I make my uh, exam test or exam question. Um, just kind of adapting something like that to the Moodle uh, format. There's our genetic code. Uh, different types of mutations we talked about. So here's a, kind of a classic type of question that could be multiple choice or written, uh, you know, asking you about mutations, right? So this says, uh, you know, what type of mutation is caused by and has all of these different questions about it. So I'm, um, maybe I'll quickly cover this now or at least give you a hint on how to do this. The very first thing is to look for your start codon. So it is right here, ATG. And then everything else comes in triplets, right? So we've got triplet here, triplet here, triplet here. And this here, actually, I know is my stop codon. So it's asking what's going on. Well, what's going on in position one? Who cares? It's not in the gene, right? So that one's not important. The other ones you have to look up. So I've got these codons here. What happens, for example, if I change uh, A to something else in that codon? Is it going to stay the same amino acid? Is it going to change to something else? Same thing with position three. And what happens if I delete something at position four, what's gonna happen? So like I said, we'll cover those next day. I know I have the answers on here, but you should be able to work out why that is the case and the name of those things. Topic 18, gene regulation. And uh, so first of all, we talked about operons. So that was important to know what an operon is. There will definitely be one or two multiple choice questions about what an operon is or what it does or, or something along that lines. Uh, I did not talk about the lactose operon, so you don't need to know this one here. So skip that. Uh, like I said, I'll, I'll offer some more clarification on Wednesday. Uh, we talked about all of the different possible things that can happen at all the different steps in eukaryotes. And uh, I know I covered these very quickly. Some of the things were things we talked about already. Uh, one thing that I did focus on though, was uh, this last type of RNA, which is found in the signal recognition particle. And uh, this is involved in basically getting, um, getting that ribosome over to the ER uh, for, for, uh, for the rough ER. So six types of RNA. So this is an important slide. I am gonna have a question on the final exam that's gonna be worth six marks and somehow it's gonna match these things up or you're gonna write a definition or, or something like that. Not sure yet, but 
memorize this slide. Definitely, 100%. Uh, topic 19, recombinant DNA. Talked about a bunch of different tools, lots of different examples, and we talked about forensics and paternity testing. So more on that later. Uh, topic 20, uh, we talked about viruses and COVID-19. And I'm just going to skip this for now. Let's see what else I have at the end here. Different life cycles. Um, this is just me brainstorming and thinking about what we covered, all the different cellular processes that we talked about in the semester. So I'm going to have this, uh, if I haven't put it up already, I'm going to put this up, but I'm going to have to update it for, because um, I forgot to change it for this semester. So kind of last thing to say is, you know, if I don't see you between uh, now and the finals, good luck. Uh, hopefully I'll hear from some of you with lots of questions uh, on what to study. If you have something you would like us to cover in particular on Wednesday, let me know before Wednesday, that would be very helpful. And uh, I probably uh, won't recognize most of you because I don't know most of you. Uh, so if, if you see me around the community or around Canada College in the future, uh, you know, do say hi to me, and let me know you're in my class. So I'll see you on Wednesday, and uh, I guess we're done for today, and we all review on Wednesday. So hopefully that will be useful for you. Have a good night.